This is Macabre Grimoire with Airy Show, Travis Nye, and Robert Maley. Hey everybody, welcome to Macabre Grimoire. I'm your host, Airy Show, here with my co-host, Robert Mailing. Hello. This is Chapter 19, Helena Blavatsky. Yes, Helena Blavatsky is our first entry here in uh, 2019 for Chapter 19, appropriately. Oh, hey, yeah. yeah. I didn't think of that. I didn't think of that either until just now. Good job. Like, that worked. <laughs> Good plan. Good plan. I planned that from you, the beginning. You did, yes. Absolutely. You're so smart. <laughs> so Helena Blavatsky is a heavy hitter in the world of the paranormal because she is considered by a lot of people, especially Kurt Vonnegut, who is you know a really really famous American author who mm-hmm. wrote like Slaughterhouse Five, uh, Breakfast at Champions, all sorts of like crazy crazy stuff, good stuff, crazy good. Uh, she is the, he called her the mother of the occult in America. That's pretty intense. Yeah, that's quite the distinction, especially from him, because he's a very, like, critical guy. Yeah. So it's just like, and maybe he didn't mean that as a compliment. I don't know. But. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> probably not, yeah. No, I, I've never even heard of him either. But uh, Hel- Helena Blavatsky is one of the most controversial figures we've covered so far. She's been called a witch, a prophet, a medium, a hack, a sorceress, a fraud, and everything in between. If you're from the West and you practice yoga, you can thank the legacy of her cultural influence. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That she kind of influenced yoga somehow. Well, we will... We we'll will get, get into that. that. As we yeah. get into her story a little bit. But yeah, she... Everything from like... You know, spiritualism, like Fox Sisters style spiritualism, right. to kind of like mo- new age modern religion stuff and its answers to, tra- tra- tradi- to traditional religion, mm-hmm. and then a lot of uh, Eastern influence that comes oh. in that was not con- that was not common in the West. Like today, we take it for granted that. You know, like when we talk about spiritualism in a secular sense, not in a like religious sense, oh, sure. that we will offhand use a comment like karma or something like that oh, that's in the popular culture. Yeah, and yeah. we're not saying it in a religious sense. Right. She's a big part of, she opened that door. Oh, thanks, Helena. Yeah. So, born in August of 1831 uh, to an ethnic Russian German aristocratic family, Blavatsky grew up to, on the crossroads of the Eastern and Western cultures. Mixing the elite European intelligentsia world view of her parents with the Eastern folklore and magic of rural Russia. Now, I saw some some sources here that talked a little bit about, like, even when she was a young lady and in her childhood and stuff like that, she Mm. was already, like, turned on to, like, imagination and spiritualism. And it was just seen as, like, so scandalous because... She was already talking about like Pat being a soldier who died in like a famous battle in Italy. Oh in a man! Past life. Oh wow! Uh, just but, talked all sorts of stuff about spirits and ghosts and right, stuff like that, right. and communicating with the dead. Are there any like um, like biographies about her? A ton. Yeah. Awesome. I'm yeah. gonna look at some up. So yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, you know we'll link to a few just a few sources here, but there's like six like full length documentaries. Uh, on YouTube, plus three or four autobiographies, and I'm sure there's many, many more. That and the, um, oh, what's the religious, not religious movement, but the Theosophical Society that she started that's into combining theology, philosophy, science, and stuff like that. Oh, cool. That still exists to this day. The actual Theosophic Society is a thing. Where, oh, it's in New York City? Uh, yeah, although, like, all their YouTube video because they have a YouTube channel, yeah. obviously. Yeah, of course. Uh, a lot of their stuff is based in Southern California, surprise, surprise, because, like I said, <laughs> yeah. she is, like, the godmother of, like, of the New Age this. movement. Yeah, yeah. So, let's see. So, she probably grew out her armpit hair before it was cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I think she came from the era where, it, and region, we're talking Eastern Europe right. in the 1830s. I'm guessing it was cool. that it, I like, think it was at that time, yeah, yeah. Going on. So let's see. Largely self-educated, she developed an interest in Western uh, esotericism uh, during her teenage years, which, yeah, one of the documentaries I saw talked a lot about, uh, that was one of the other things that was scandalous, but her parents didn't care, was that she just devoured books, like everything she could get her hands on, all sorts of like theology, philosophy, stuff like that, Mm -hmm. just, 
you know, her mind was turned on and this was her, her sandbox was the spiritual and metaphysical world. Right, right. Uh, according to her later claims, in 1849, she embarked on a series of world travels. This is where we get into some of the controversy. Oh, here. sure. Visiting Europe, the Americas, and India, claiming that during that uh, period, she encountered a group of spiritual adepts called the Masters of Ancient Wisdom. We'll talk a, lot, a little bit about this later on, but this this stuff gets like high weirdness. Oh, sure. Uh, who sent her signatees to... Uh, sent her to Singatees, I'm hoping I'm saying that right. Shigatsis? Shigatsis, maybe? Tibet, uh, where they trained her to develop a deeper understanding of the synthesis of religion, philosophy, and science. So in the title here, we called her the real-life Doctor Strange. Mm -hmm. That whole trope in TV shows and old comic, even like Scrooge McDuck comic books from the 30s and stuff like that, where... Or in Indiana Jones, where they go to Tibet and they go to like, oh, oh there's a hidden Shaolin city in the mountains where they have secret knowledge. Right. Uh, Iron Fist, Marvel's Iron Fist, that whole trope. Mm-hmm. Madame awesome. Lavasky, she oh, started that. Wow. Because she's the one who like supposedly her and her her uh, her guy friend uh, Alcott. Um, we'll talk about it later. Oh sure. Uh, the two of them supposedly, but this is where the controversy is because a lot of people claim and, and a lot of historians agree that actually they were just hanging out in East, eastern europe at the time and researching sure they, didn't, they say they go but that they didn't actually go to some of these places oh okay they do eventually go to india yeah because there's a whole thing where we'll get into cl- how her effect on colonialism and stuff oh, like that sure, sure, sure. but uh yeah th- this point where she's talking about the like ancient masters and stuff like that and there are people during this time who claim that she could like when she was communicating with them and writing her her first big book, which is, uh, oh, what is that called? It's Isis Rising or something like that, which uh, nowadays, it, out of context, sounds pretty terrible. Oh, God. Uh, I, yeah. Well, I don't see it here. Oh, this is going to drive me nuts. It's probably, in some, it's probably in the Wikipedia article, maybe? Yeah, probably. But uh, anyway, but before we get into uh, that, let's talk a little bit about... You know, she gets into the ancient masters who she claims, like, and Alcott, even, he was with her when she's writing this this book, um, is claiming that there's, like, spiritual energy flowing through her and that it's not just her writing it. And so their claim was, there, and they even named them and had portraits of them and <gasps> oh, stuff Oh, it's like almost that. like her spiritual guides or whatever. Yeah, are, there, there's these like, two spiritual gurus who are sitting in Tibet somewhere who are helping guide her to write this Oh. Oh, uh, interesting. Account. That's di- that's a different way. That that's completely different than what I was thinking of. You're saying that there's actually two pe- two physical people in a different country that she's channeling, or as I was thinking, like but she's channeling her spirit guides, and then the spirit guides are writing the book because like I've. But they, the way she talks about them and stuff, mm-hmm. is that. They are kind of like not. They're more than human, like spirit guides. Oh. And they would even like illustrate them and stuff like that. I'm looking for the Wikipedia page here. It doesn't have pictures of them, but uh, yeah. But anyway. they were physical people alive. That was the that was the claim that they were living physical people, but that they were also like spiritual beings. Yeah. Oh, like, interesting. Basically, like super powered. Sure, sure. Because they were just such high mystics and stuff like that. Yeah. The, I mean, the, the name for them that she used was that they were the uh, um, the masters of ancient wisdom. And they were oh. like top of, part of a secret. Oh, I bet they are. Like I bet that. they are. Because I, I went through a period where I was obsessed if with... If you look at this little picture right here, yeah. those two drawings, those are of the two guys she claims that were in Tibet who were guiding her hand. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, what I was going to say is that um, I went through a period um, during my development, my psychic development, where I was obsessed with um, trying to figure out who my spirit guides were and just really wanted to know their names, wanted to know everything about them. And I think a lot of people who are developing spiritually go through this phase where you just, you want to put a label on something or you want to figure out something. And so I read quite a few books on how to basically get to know your spirit guides or get to know them. And, um, and basically like a lot of the books I read were, were not just books written by the author themselves, but the author claimed that it was the the book was being written by their spirit guides or their or their spirit team. So like they weren't actually physically writing it, but their spirit team was actually physically that's, writing that's it. That's exactly and she's like the first person in the West 
to be like talking about this short of like right. the Prophet Muhammad saying it was through an angel or something, you know, getting yeah. into some super religious stuff. Yep. Uh, she's the first modern person in the West to be claiming that, yeah, these spiritual projections of mm-hmm. these like highly enlightened, you know, ascended mm-hmm. masters right. or whatever yeah. are guiding my hand as I write this as well as spirits. Because, mm-hmm. yeah, there's a lot of people out there. Um, well, should, there's a lot of books out there like that where people will write that saying that, you know, my spirit guides are guiding me through writing this. And so and it's kind of interesting. There's a few books where you can where it definitely feels like it is. But then there's other books where I'm just like, oh, I don't know. Like, yeah. it, like I don't know. Like when they start going into um, like with the past life of their spirit guides or whatever, I'm just like, I don't know. I feel like you want to put too much of a human aspect on it. Whereas like your spirit guides, to me, they should be like really disconnected from Earth at all. But it's still understand that like you're going through something. I don't know. Anyways, but yeah. I totally understand like the concept of channeling a higher being that probably because we're having an external force guy. Right, right, right. Something. Exactly, exactly. Um, and just for the record, like oh, your spirit guides have definitely have been incarnated many, many times, many lifetimes here on Earth, but now that they are more spiritually evolved, um, they no longer incarnate, and like they are the ones who guide you through, basically, life. So sure. that's my, what I've read, and also kind of like my experience, so. Okay. So let's see, we were, we were talking about in Tibet. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and both contemporary critics and later biographers argued that uh, some or all of these foreign visits were fictitious, and that she spent most of this period in in Europe. And that's something I mentioned earlier: is that, that she never actually went to Tibet. Right. She okay. never went to Tibet. We do later after she's written this, mm-hmm. uh, and the book was Isis Unveiled. Sorry, Isis oh. or Isis. but it, it was Isis that was in the name of it. But of mm-hmm. course, obviously, before the you know modern connotation of Isis. Right. 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 Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah, they really polluted that because that, like, cult of ISIS and stuff like that, that's like a really ancient thing. And the mm-hmm. fact that they use that abbreviation is also, like, deeply ironic. And you could tell they have no appreciation for history that they use <laughs> yeah. that. Like, yes. whatsoever. They're, like, no sense of irony. Right, right. Uh, fanatics. They're not big on uh, the no. whole, like, abstract, out of the box kind of, like, right. thinking or making connections like that. But let's see. By the early 1870s, Blavatsky was involved in the spiritualist movement, because it at one so she starts in in Europe, mm-hmm. and she marries like Helena uh, Blavats- Blavatsky is not her original last name. She marries a guy, uh, and then gets the last name Blavatsky. Oh, and travels, I believe, with him. She ends up having like three husbands, but uh, oh. yeah, <laughs> cool. Um, Travels with him to the United States, and then it's uh, this Olcott, if I can find his full name in my notes. If I can. Henry Steele Olcott. There you go. Yeah. Henry Steele Olcott. Uh, he is already like a rising star slash major authority figure in the New York spiritualist scene, mm. like where you get into that, like Houdini and the Fox Sister. I guess that would be later, later right. than this. Right. But, uh, well, 1870s, not not. This would be about that time. Yeah. So, um, not Houdini, but... It, no, no, it's a little bit too soon for Houdini. A little bit too, too soon for that. But as the spiritualist movement is really taking off in the post-Civil War Victorian era, uh, he is, like, a major authority. Like, when he writes something and sends it to, like, the New York Times, they write it as a, like, this is kind of the spiritualist community's response oh, to... Sure. You know, like, these, uh, you know, like, this thing or that thing of the day, you know? Mm-hmm. So he kind of, like, helps her get published and talking in uh, the eastern United States this same way. And so then that kind of builds her, like, authority and stuff like that. And suddenly she becomes, like, an authoritative figure in the The spiritualist community. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, yeah, in New York City, uh, Blavatsky co-founded the Theosophical Society. Um. Here. Sorry, I've jumped around. My bad. Oh, it's fine. Uh, by the early 1870s, Blavatsky was involved in the spiritualist movement. Although defending genuine experience of spiritualist phenomena, she argued against mainstream spiritualist idea that the entities contacted were the spirits of the dead. Oh. Ro- relocating to the United States in 1873, she befriended Henry Scott Steele. And here's the deal. they say They say befriended, and everyone's like, well, did they do it? 
<laughs> you know, like that's what that's what everybody's wondering because for the rest of her life she's always hanging out with him and they're like the best of friends and they like you know when they're talking to each other and stuff like that everyone's yeah. just like they're practically like soulmates and all this stuff. Oh sure. But they claim and contemporary sources uh, are kind of like yeah they there was never any. Like they didn't see each other no that way. They were panky. more like peer. Yeah, there was no hanky panky yeah. whatsoever. Um, That's kind of cool. Yeah. So they they were just kind of like kindred spirits in an, in an intellectual sense of they were both like right. You know, they both passionately were believing in spiritualism and spiritualism that was even beyond the idea just of like, like psychic with BFFs. Them. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So he helped her and uh, got her public attention as a spirit medium. Uh, let's see, and then obviously. Uh, during that time, there were lots of people that were out there to d- debunk spiritualists, so she was the target right. of attacks on that front. When they rightly should. You know, I don't think that it, you should give your your 100% faith into anybody that you haven't personally vetted or don't know anything about. You know what I mean? Right, and you can you can dive into it deeper, but, you know, like, she got involved with some different spiritualist, like, groups and performers and stuff like mm-hmm. that who were just, like, you know... Who did end up turn out to be frauds and were making like right. spirit photos and so doing Fox Sister kind of like mm-hmm. scammy kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And you know, she got swept up in that with a lot of other people. Right. So anyway, in New York City, Blavatsky co founded the Theosophical Society with uh, Olcott and William Corn Judge in eighteen seventy five. And then in uh, eighteen seventy seven is when she published Isis Unveiled, a book outlining her theosophical worldview. Now, I didn't read the whole thing for this podcast, but I read several chapters of it as much as I could because it's, I mean, it's not like old English where it's super hard to read. It's not even like Shakespeare hard to read, but it is like, so clearly someone has a thesaurus and it's Victorian Uh, times. Oh, sure. Uh, And uh, that, and there's so much like, Understanding the difference between metaphysical and spiritual and, you know, like, just like, it, it, it's it's word salad, like, big time. Yeah. But it's, her big thing, especially, like, and I realize it's kind of like, I'm tilted that way because I read early chapters and the first chapter is all about why, the, the need for this book and why current religions have totally failed. I mean, there's even, like, dollar amounts of, like, the, pro, you know, it's like the Protestant, um, uh, churches in America have raised $53 million this year, blah, 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 which Mm -hmm. would be funny to know what that number is like nowadays. Oh, my God. Uh, Or what that is adjusted for inflation. Jesus. From the 1870s. Yeah. And anyway, uh, you know, talking about how much money they've raised, but they can't fill a spiritual need in the community and things like that. Mm. They It's talking about how, you know, spiritualism and especially science has completely, it gets into a very, like, uh... She doesn't, she's not Nietzsche, just she doesn't go, God is dead. Right. But kind of, in mm-hmm. a sense of, like, the old religions are dead and they're not adapting and don't work for this modern world. Oh, yeah. Of the 1870s. Yeah, right. If you're so modern. <laughs> but, yeah, the, I was surprised how much it was almost like a, as, like, a political and theological, like, I want to say religious, but not in a spiritual sense, purely in a, like, theocratic. Right, right. <laughs> Since it was. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of that in there. Um, and yeah, it, it, here's here's a good comment I found about it. It, it associ- uh, The book outlining her theosophical worldview, associating it closely with the esoteric themes of hermeticism and neopo- neopla- neoplantos- plant- plantonism. Okay, yeah. I'm glad I'm not the only one baffled by that word. But here's the quote I was trying to make my way to. Uh, <laughs> Blavatsky described theosophy as the synthesis of science, religion, and philosophy, which, yeah, when you read the book, she's that's part of why it's word salad is because she's oh. trying to com- cram together the science of the, you know, the early scientific revolution where they're just like, right. you know, all the low-hanging fruit is starting to get picked up. So it's like electricity, motors, oh. stuff like that. Uh, just understanding. So maybe like how quantum physics actually relates to the spiritual world and like you know, yeah. and and how the spiritual world can relate to the and, religion world and how it's all kind of maybe one thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and trying to, like, kind of put them... Well, you know, I, I read a book over the break that mm-hmm. was all about how closely related science and mysticism are as far as, like, 
there was not a hard line between them until about this time. Oh, sure, sure, sure. The whole idea that there's like a hard separation is like a, you know, is a very, very modern concept because it's like even in the 1870s and 1890s, uh, and we've talked about this before, there'd be, you know, chemists would do chemistry demonstrations mm -hmm. and they it would be like a sold out ticket event in a little amphitheater at a, like a medical college or something right. like that. Yeah. And p people would ooh and ah and it would just be like, you know, it's like they didn't have TV back then. Right. Yeah, that. that's so, true. That's fair. So, and especially with the educated classes and stuff like that, mm -hmm. they were super fascinated in this. And they're just like the whole world was opening up to us like, wow, imagine all these new chemicals and all these new sciences and optics and physics and things right. like that. Right. Um, so it's just a scientific explosion. Uh, yeah. But anyway, they weren't always so, weren't separated. And, right. And, uh, She's really a product of that kind of thinking where, you know, she basically sees spiritualism as a type of science. Oh, sure. I can get on board with that. In 1880, she and Alcott moved to India, where the society was allied with Arya Samji, a Hindu re reform movement. That same year, while, while in Ceylon, she and Alcott became supposedly the first people from the United States to form formally convert to Buddhism. Although opposed by the British administration, theosophy spread rapidly in India, but experienced internal problems after Blavatsky was in, accused of producing fraudulent paranormal phenomena. Aww. Now here's, this gets, this has its, this, I mean, just this part of it, you can unpack into like a big thing because to understand at the time, tensions are really running high. You're starting to get your first like nation state anarchist style like independence movements in india right where there's factions who are just like we've got to get these you know outsiders out of our country that are like ruining it and running right, it right right um meanwhile the british empire is still still in they're not in the friendly empire phase they're in the still in the ruthless like oh you published a pamphlet about how you don't like us beating people up we're gonna beat you up yeah yeah, yeah. and uh they were annoyed the British authorities to no end by Blavatsky because uh, she was empowering uh, people in India. Basically, not you know like she wasn't getting on a car and telling them to rise up, but kind of spiritually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And uh, the mystics in India really welcomed her and really enjoyed her and Alcott because they said they were the first two uh, Europeans who had shown up in India who, rather than coming to convert people. They came and were like, tell us about your spirituality. Right. Tell us about your religion. We want to learn about your wisdom. And More of an like open that. ear and an open heart than do it our way. Yeah. And, you know, I, I take this with a little bit of grain of salt, but this could be just the era we live in. Because I don't want to buy into the whole, like, white savior thing where she was, like, you know, this white white person that showed up and helped India rediscover its oh, own religion. sure. I don't How, think, yeah. However... Um, you know, there's contemporary sources, Indian contemporary sources, oh. who are very, like, you know, she was a strong positive influence in us starting to take our own religion seriously again. Because after being under British rule for, you know, umpteen hundred years right. or whatever, yeah. uh, the upper classes in India were even just kind of like, well, Hinduism, you know, and Buddhism are these, like, those are the peasant religions and stuff like that. It's like, if you want to be, uh, you know, socially upwardly mobile, you're you're going to be into Christianity and yep. stuff like that. And, you know, that, that whole cultural oh, divide yeah, you get absolutely. when a society is being controlled from above uh, by a foreign outside source. And she kind of gives them, or helps, because, like I said, I don't want to give it in the white savior complex and say, the white lady came and made it all oh, better. right. But, uh... <laughs> Um, by the same token, she helped that, like the upper classes in India, uh, supposedly just from what I've read, appreciate their own, like native cultures right. and religions and spiritual Trying identity and stuff like that. Get back in touch with like where they came from. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, reminded them that it's mm -hmm. like, you know, your, the, you know, the Indian subcontinent has its own, you know, with spiritual wisdom and things like that mm -hmm. that have been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. And here are these two you know, especially Americans, freedom all the way, Westerners who show up and are just very, like, tell us all about your religion and culture, and right. this is so fascinating, and stuff like that. And they'd write, and they were sending through the Theosophical Society stuff like this back, information about, you know, Indian culture and religion and things like that back to America. Like I said, where you're getting that whole, like, 
yo like the idea people being oh because yoga doesn't take off i think until like more like the 50s and 60s oh sure sure but uh but the whole idea in your head that like you know what yoga is or kind of have a vague idea you know even if you're not someone who's done it before you have a vague idea of what yoga is right yeah and the whole popular culture idea that you'd use a term like karma or something like that <laughs> mm-hmm. and just in like casual language uh she's opening the door for that there, there's a big cultural uh transfer back and forth going on here mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and like i said the british were just like pissed to no, to no end that this was going on so i'm trying to figure out i believe they threw her out of india but i can't find it in my notes and i can't remember on what grounds it was or something like that or they were threatening to charge her with something or something like that so oh. what i remember is she gets sent back to the united states and Alcott stays, and he keeps the information transfer going and keeps building on the the work with the Theos- Theosophic Society. Right. But like I said, internal internal politics and turmoil within that organization, as well as, you know, like getting debunked when they're like stretching stuff and pushing stuff too far with the, with the mysticism stuff is, uh, you know, undermines them over time. Right, right, right. But in the meantime, Blavatsky... Uh, Amid ailing health in 1885, she returned to Europe, there establishing the Blavatsky Lodge in London. Here she published The Secret Doctrine, a commentary on what she claimed were ancient Tibetan manuscripts, as well as two further books, The Key to Theosophy and The Voice of the Silence. So all together, I think we've got Secret Doctrine is 1888. Mm Mm-hmm. Isis Unveiled is 1877. The Voice of Silence. I didn't read anything about that one, so I'm not sure. But that was 1889. Mm-hmm. And The Key to Theosophy, uh, 1889. So that looks like 1889 is like the last year she did any right. uh, any writing, which makes sense because uh, her health just kept getting worse and worse. And then finally she died of influenza on May 8th, 1891. So how old would, would that make her? Because I don't see where she, what year she was. Oh, 1831, 1891. Math is hard. It's so hard. 60-something, probably. Yeah, I think so. 60? This is thrilling radio. It's yeah, what types we're going to Type it in. Do it. 1891 minus 1831. That's probably this is- 60. This is riveting. It is 60. It's exactly 60. God damn. So she was, wow. That's so weird to think, like, my parents are, like, my dad is 61. So to think, like, you know what I mean? Like. Oh, the age thing is. I know. It's crazy. Because just like, just like the way that they live, you know, in that time, you know, I think it almost like aged you faster because you didn't have access to as good as nutrition and, you know, medical resources, you know, yeah. during that era because i do a lot of um like live action um like murder mystery stuff at the at uh the pedigree museum here in sure. town and like they have a lot of artifacts or and and in one of the rooms they have um clothing from that era and like the boots for some of these women were so skinny because they were so malnourished during that time i'm like oh yeah. my god i can't imagine just being the, like that frail you know, just because you didn't have access to, you know, basically your what, seven food groups, six. I don't. Is it seven? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It's a food pyramid. It's now. a food pyramid. It's now. a hybrid pyramid because they got rid of the food pyramid from when I was growing up. That the giant block of carbs at the bottom. Yeah. It was like the number one thing you're yeah. supposed to eat. You're not supposed to do that anymore, which sucks because that's why I love carbs so much. I know, and I'm no, allergic. I just love carbs because I love carbs. I, I love like carbs it. too, but I'm allergic to the wheat carbs. Oh, okay. I know. I just got that sucks. I just figured that out, which so fucking sucks. But but I mean I can have taters and stuff like that. So I'm not allergic to those kind of carbs. There you go. Just the wheat carbs. So but yeah, but yeah. It's, it's interesting to see like the like a sixty one year old back then, like you figure frail, frail old woman, and sixty one yeah. year old now, it's just like, like oh uh, my god, they're like running marathons and like they're running marathons, and even, and even if they're not that physically active, they're yeah. still like, oh, we drove you know drove three thousand miles to Texas to our right. winter condo, and now yeah. we're gonna go swim in the ocean, <laughs> aka my parents right now, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> I know like um, I had I had a great great grandfather who passed away in his 60s in the early 1900s or so um 
Oh, so like 1920s or 30s. I don't know. Anyways, but either way, like, you know, like 60, that was probably like our equivalent of like the 80s and like being like in your 80s or 90s probably. Yeah. So, because. That that 50 is the new 40 kind of like right. thing that started in like the 80s. Yeah. Like that's very much like, it's totally based on an individual's experience of health because, you know, not all 60 to 70 year olds, et cetera, are created equal. Right. In experience. Right. At exactly. All. Exactly. So, yeah. Well, that's an interesting, that's, she's an interesting person for sure. I'm surprised. I, I've not heard of her or anyone um that we've covered today which is i mean that doesn't say a lot because i don't i i try to keep myself in a bubble when it comes to researching like mediums and like history and stuff like that so but she's definitely now i'm like "Mm, i think i kind of want to read the books that she's put out just to see like i said i i don't i can't speak for the other ones but isis unveiled is very like it's thick it's yeah it's not that long it's just very Den- yeah, like you said, dense, thick. Yeah. It's dense. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially, you can feel the, like, I don't want to say rage, but just, like, the frustration and anger at traditional... Religion. She has her, Yeah, she has her her clear enemies, and she she has what she likes and what she doesn't like, and right. you're going to know right away which is which. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Very, very strong-willed on that one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But, yeah, um... So that's Madame Blavatsky, the the mother mother basically the real life Doctor Strange, the mother of the occult in the United States. Uh and yeah, originator of yoga. Not yeah. like I think yoga I want we'll look into this, but I think at some point like in the fifties or sixties there was like a movement that, that really brought that over and really had oh, it, like, kick off. But, popularized it, yeah. But she's a big part of the like cultural exchange of us knowing things like like that, that yoga exists mm-hmm. or the and like i said the trope that is just an absolutely not just dr strange but an absolutely every like piece of indiana jones style adventure comic book radio serial from the 30s fiction of the going to tibet and finding right. a secret city with secret knowledge oh sure the ancient ascended masters right. and iron fist and kung lao and yeah. all this stuff a thousand percent Madame Blavatsky. That all goes. That's all on her. <laughs> yeah, it's of course it was started by a woman. Of course a woman did it, and a man has to take credit for it. I don't know. That's, just, <laughs> that's my joke, kind of. I don't know. So there you go. Uh, thank you, everyone, once again for listening to Macabre Grimoire. Feels good to be back. Yes, finally. Ugh. Yes. <laughs> it, it is. It has been a difficult winter, but we we are back <laughs> and uh, to entertain you with more tales of the strange and the weird. And hopefully we'll get our uh, expert magician back in here for the next round. Yeah. It, like we said, the winter's been intense and busy, and he's I think he's the busiest of both of us, probably, based on what Right now, seen. yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for listening, uh, and we will see you all next time. Bye! Macabre Grimoire is a production of the SiouxEmpire.com. Learn more at macabregrimoire.com.